John's Gospel, chapter number five, and we'll read these verses of Scripture together. John, chapter number five, and we'll start reading here in verse number one. John, chapter five. And verse number one, Father, we ask that you would touch us now as we go into your word. I pray that you would illuminate the scriptures to our hearts. Father, you said in your word, if I be lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. And Lord, today I pray that you'd help us to lift you up. Help us to lift Jesus up. Help us to lift up the cross. And Father, you would do your part. The Holy Spirit would do his part and draw all men unto himself, and I pray, God, that you'd touch us today. Help us from your word. Speak to us, God. Lead us, guide us, and direct us from your holy scriptures. We'll be careful to give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. All right, look at verse number one. The Bible says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem, now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep, by the sheep market, a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having how many porches? Five. That's a good number to remember. That's a good number to know. Five porches. And in these porches lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for what? The moving of the water. This is one of the most unique stories in the New Testament. The Bible said, For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool. And the Bible said, Troubled the waters. I don't know if they bubbled or rippled. Or the waters were troubled. Whosoever then, after that the troubling of the water... They stepped in, and the Bible said, and was made whole of whatsoever disease that he had. Now, verse number five, here we go. There was a certain man there at this pool called Bethesda, which had an infirmity. In the Greek translated, it's talking about he was lame, he was crippled. Thirty and eight years. It's a long time. That's about my, most of my life, 30 and 8 years. The Bible said, And a certain man was there which had an infirmity, 30 and 8 years. And when Jesus saw him lie, and knew, underscore that word knew, and knew that it had been now a long time in that case, he said unto him, Wilt thou be made Whole. Wilt thou be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man. And when the water is troubled, to put me in the pool. But while I am coming, another will step down before me. Jesus said unto him, Rise. Take up thy bed and walk. Verse 9. And how quick? Immediately. I like how God works, don't you? He don't waste no time. And immediately. The man was what? He's made whole. And the Bible said he took up his bed and he walked. Now, notice what the Bible said in verse number 9. We, the Bible hadn't told us this yet, but you're about to find out that it was on the same day was the Sabbath. It was illegal to take any items from one place to another, according to Jewish law during this time. And the Jews therefore said unto him that was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for thee to carry thy bed today. The man been crippled for 38 years, and they're upset he's walking around with a bed. <laughs> and he answered them, he said, He that made me whole, <laughs> the same said unto me, Take up thy 
bed and walk. And they asked him, What man is that which saith unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? For he that was healed wist not who it was, for Jesus had conveyed himself away. Because there was a multitude being in the place at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus kind of covertly hid himself among the people there. And then the Bible said the man departed. And we find out later he goes into the temple. And the Bible says that he told the Jews, verse 15, that it was Jesus which had made him whole. You can be seated. Thank you for standing for the reading of God's holy word. So, I love the book of John. I love this gospel because John presents the historical account of the life of Christ to us in a more intimate way than the other gospels. If you remember, it was John that was the disciple who Jesus loved. That's what the Bible says about John. Matter of fact, it, the disciple who Jesus loved was John, the one that was always leaning on his bosom. You ever seen the old picture of the, uh, the disciples in the upper room, the Lord's Supper? You remember that picture, that famous painting? You know, a lot of people have it in their homes. There's always that disciple that's got his head laying on the breast of Jesus. That's John. And other disciples, I'm going to just be honest with you, other disciples, they knew the voice of Jesus. They walked with him for three years and they fellowshiped with him. But John knew more than the voice of Jesus. John knew the breath of Jesus. He stayed pretty close. And the closer you get, the more intimate you will get with the Son of God. Now, I want you to notice the Jesus in the passage of Scripture that we just read in John chapter number 5. The Jesus that we're reading about is not a conformist. <laughs> um, Jesus always had a problem conforming and complying to man's laws. Um, he didn't really go along with man's ideas and man's ways. People today, when they think about the Jesus that I know, they, they think that Jesus was a passive and that he was, you know, to go along to get along and he was quiet and Jesus was shy and Jesus was timid. But that ain't the Jesus of this Bible. The Jesus of this Bible uh, was a revolutionary, if you would. He'd come to change some things. I would say he was probably more in the eyes of the religious crowd a rebel. Matter of fact, Jesus had a way of upsetting the status quo. Church leaders of his day didn't like him or his ways. Jesus broke rules and he broke their laws. Matter of fact, it was Jesus just before this passage that we read that walked into the temple, walked into the synagogue. And what did he do? He was flipping over tables and used a whip to chase out the money changers in the house of God. That's the Jesus of this Bible. So no doubt this Jesus that we're talking about is definitely not content. He's not uh, quiet. He's different. Matter of fact, Jesus did not capitulate to the Pharisees. He didn't conform to the Sadducees. And uh, he didn't have the approval of the scribes. He was in a, a class of his own. That's my Jesus. Right. Wherever he went, he disrupted things. And I'm going to be honest with you. What he did at the Pool of Bethesda, he started a ripple effect that would lead, later end him up crucified on a cross at Calvary. This is the beginning stages of that. And so Jesus knew what he was doing. He's being led by the Spirit of God. And if you thought that the waters were being troubled in verse number 4 that we just got through reading, you ain't seen nothing yet because that's what Jesus does is he troubles the waters. That's what he, he does in his earthly ministry. Matter of fact, he'd cause ripples everywhere he would go. Jesus would come to town and you couldn't have a funeral with Jesus because he'd break it up. The funeral home would have to give a refund to the family because Jesus would raise the dead unto life. 
You couldn't invite him into your home because if you did, people would rip the roof off your house just to get to see Jesus. He was a, I'm telling you, he'd cause ripples everywhere he went. If Jesus was here in this service this morning, he'd cause some ripples. If he ever got in your heart, he'd cause some ripples, amen. If he ever got in your home or your house, he'd cause ripples. If you ever let Jesus get into your finances, he'll cause ripples. Matter of fact, if you don't want to, if you don't, listen, if you want to keep things nice and calm, just keep Jesus out and you'll keep things nice and calm. Verse number one, the Bible said, now this was the time of the feast. This was the feast of the Jews. And by all accounts, Jesus should be headed to the celebration of the feast. We know He's a Jew. But instead of going to the feast, where does He go? He doesn't go to the feast. Jesus is headed to Bethesda. He's decided to stop by a place that most reputable leaders of His day wouldn't want to go. You say, what do you mean place where reputable leaders wouldn't want to go. This place of Bethesda was a place, I would say it was probably a smelly place. It was a diseased place. It was a infectious place. Only people that hospitals and doctors and medication couldn't fix, they were sent to Bethesda. And these people at Bethesda were pitiful people. They were poor. They were homeless. They were hopeless. Their lives were filled with problems. This was a place in Jerusalem that the normal people, you like how I say that, the normal people could avoid this area. They, they didn't have to go there to Bethesda. You could walk around Bethesda. You could bypass Bethesda. You didn't have to deal with people and their problems. By the way, everybody will be your friend until you have problems. This was a pool that the general public would avoid. But yet Jesus, are y'all with me? He decided to go to the pool that day. He decided to head down to that stinky place. He decided to go by that diseased place, the place where nobody else was willing to go. Jesus was deciding that he was going to go. Let me say something about about Jesus. Jesus wasn't afraid to go into places that others wouldn't go. Matter of fact, most of the time he got in arguments, it wasn't with a drunkard. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't with the woman caught in the act of adultery. You know who he always got in argument with? Church folk, religious people. The religious people of his day, they didn't like him. He was, he was, a, he was different. A matter of fact, the Bible said he hung out with sinners. He went home and ate with them. <laughs> Remember Zacchaeus went home with him? They, they, spread the, they spread it all around. He goes home with tax collectors. Jesus wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. He wasn't afraid hanging around broken people. He wasn't afraid hanging out with sick people. He wasn't afraid of hanging out with afflicted people. I'm glad for that this morning. He wasn't, he wasn't afraid to go where the outcasts were. Amen? He wasn't afraid to stop by the pool of Bethesda. And what these people didn't realize that day was, you see, they were there for the pool. These outcasts were there waiting for the waters to be troubled, but they had no idea that power had just stopped by their way. <laughs> they had no idea that virtue had just come into the pool of Bethesda. Matter of fact, Jesus would normally take his power and he would bring Bring his power to those who needed it the most. <laughs> he would take his power. By the way, it wasn't in the temple. This is outside the temple. This is not in the synagogue. This is outside the synagogue. He would take his power. He would bring his virtue to those who didn't deserve his power and those that didn't deserve his virtue. Those in the lowly estate. And if that's not true, I wouldn't be here today. If that's not true, you wouldn't be here today. I'm just going to say on the authority of the Word of God, I am glad that when I could not come to where he was I'm glad Jesus came to me praise God none of these people could get up and get to Jesus but Jesus could get to them and I'm glad he stopped by matter of fact he came to them and he sat where they sat you remember that day he met you for the first time and he sat where you sat in verse number 6, the Bible says that when he saw him lie, he knew that he had been there. That's supernatural. Jesus goes to the pool of Bethesda and he picks out the man who'd been there the longest. 
And the Bible said that he knew that he'd been there. How did he know? i tell you how he knew. He's omniscient. He knows everything. Amen? Jesus knew he was the one that'd been there the longest for. How long? 38 years. By the way, that's a long time. You realize that Moses and the children of Israel spent 40 years wandering around in the wilderness the same amount of time this man sat by the pool of Bethesda? Matter of fact, most people living during this time didn't even live to 38 years old. They died young. This man outlived most people. His infirmity was longer than some people lived. His whole life is in this infirmity. And Jesus knew that he'd been there the longest. And Jesus goes to have a conversation. He goes to have a conversation with a man that didn't own a toothbrush. He he didn't have no cologne. He didn't have no deodorant. He didn't have a bath. He'd been laying by the pool of Bethesda. How long? 38 years. Well, I'm not going to go talk to them. They look dirty. They They look like a sinner. That's what attracted Jesus. That's who, that's, who he, that's who he was going to, to, to minister to. See, he, everybody else, they said, well, he's repulsive. She's repulsive. That's the one Jesus go get. Right. Amen? And he goes down to this man. By the way, the Bible never gives us his name. You know what that makes me wonder? This, this man was a nameless man. He wasn't a person of influence. This man had no political power. He wasn't a doctor. He wasn't a lawyer. He had no wealth. This man had no money. He was just a sick man, but yet Jesus came to where he was. I felt like preaching this morning, amen? And if you felt like going to church, and I felt like preaching, and we got together, something might happen around here. Now watch this. If he can go to this man and speak to this nobody that nobody cares about at the pool of Bethesda, surely he can come speak to you this morning. The Bible says he comes to Bethesda. Now you say, what's Bethesda? The Bible tells us the name of Bethesda is the house of mercy or the house of grace is the pool of Bethesda. By the way, you realize that's exactly what I am this morning. I'm a Bethesda. (laughs) I'm a house of mercy. I'm a house of grace. If you're saved by the grace of God, you're a house of mercy and you're a house of grace. And watch what the Bible says. And this place had five porches. And the Bible said that all these outcasts, all these sick and diseased sinners, all of these people that were here at Bethesda, the Bible said that they lay where in Notice verse number three. They had Bethesda had five porches, and in these lay a great multitude. We, when we think of porches, that we think of porches of something that you'd see on the front of a house where people would sit. But what this word in the Greek means is a portico, uh, the same word where we derive the word carport, if you would. It's a place of, uh, it's like a shelter place. So around the pool of Bethesda, there were five porches, and they're called porticos. The Bible calls them porches. It's a shelter. These people here are at Bethesda, (laughs) and they're around five porches. You know what the Bible says about five? You know what the number five in the Bible is, don't you? It's the number of grace. Five porches, the number of grace. You know what I like about that? All of the disgrace were hanging around with grace. Amen. Everybody that was disgraced was sheltered and covered by grace. And I'm going to just say something. Yes, this man wasn't whole. He wasn't healed, but he was covered by grace. He was covered by one of these porches, by one of these porticos. Amen. Not everybody in this room this morning has been healed and made whole. Are you wouldn't be here. But I'm going to tell you what God has done for everybody here. We've been covered and sheltered by His amazing grace. Amen. And you know what that shelter did? It, kept, it was a place for them to keep the elements off of them. The heat. The Palestinian heat that would beat down on them. It was a safe place to wake each year until the waters were troubled. So here we have a place of grace for the disgraced. Let me give you a verse of scripture just while I'm here. Romans 5.20. The Bible said we're synagogue bound. Grace does does much more abound. Amen? Hallelujah. And so here we have Jesus. And this man had been there at the pool under these porticos for 38 years. You can't live 38 years without eating. Right? Somebody been feeding him? 
Some, somebody, been, somebody had been handing him out. They I mean, had been taking handouts. You know, people coming by giving him change. He's a beggar. That's what they were. They were beggars. But he lived for 38 years. For 38 years, he'd been begging. For 38 years, he'd been getting help. For 38 years, he'd been getting handouts. You know, a lot of people are like that. Some people just like being sick. <laughs> you say, you really believe that, brother? Yeah, they love being sick. They love the attention. It's getting quiet all of a sudden in here. They love the attention. I don't know why it's getting quiet. You know, help sometimes hinders people. You can help somebody so much that it enables them to stay helpless. And I'm going to tell you what Jesus is doing in this passage of Scripture. He's not coming down there to help this man. You don't realize this. Jesus ain't coming down there to give him a hand out. Right. Jesus is coming down here to kick him out. Jesus is coming to the pool of Bethesda to serve an eviction notice. You've been here long enough. It's time to get out of here and get on your own. Some people don't like hearing that. <laughs> Some people like staying in the nest, you know what I mean? <laughs> Mama bird trying to kick them. They love that nest, praise God. Jesus, hey, let me just say this. Don't let your porch of grace be your prison. A lot of people take advantage of the porches of grace that God gives and they become prisons. Listen, God don't want you under a porch. He wants you in a house, praise God. <laughs> he says in verse number six, Wilt thou be made whole? Now think about that. Here you have a man that can't walk. Here's a man that's lame. To me, that sounds like a crazy question. The, I know the answer. And I'm not the lame man. I'm not the crippled man. I know what the answer is. Yes, I want to be made whole. You know what the answer is. Yes, I want to be made whole. Notice Jesus didn't say, now I'm willing to make you whole, but he's saying, are you willing to be made whole? That's a big difference. Wilt thou, wilt thou be made whole? Here's the thing about Jesus. He ain't going to do nothing for you till you invite him. <laughs> he ain't going to force himself on you. He's not going to pressure you into coming. He ain't going to pressure you into believing and trusting in him. He's just going to ask the question, Wilt thou be made whole? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You've got to invite him in. Wilt thou? Are you what Jesus is doing? Jesus is breaking this man's will. Right. Do you want what I got? It's what he's asking. Jesus was a confrontational Jesus. <laughs> he's confronting this man's will. Now look at verse number seven. He don't answer like we think he would answer. Wilt thou be made whole? What's he say? Sir, I have no man when the water's troubled to put me into the pool. And when I'm yet coming, another will step down before me and get in the pool before me. He had excuses for why he wasn't getting better. People always jumping in front of me and everything and all, oh, Jesus. Isn't it funny how some people never get off the porch because it's always somebody else's fault? Right. Jesus, ain't no man helping me get down into the pool, Jesus. A lot of times we'll put somebody or something and we'll always let that be the point to enable us to remain Sick and in the condition we're in. L look at verse number seven. He actually slips up and tells on himself. Shh, don't, 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 don't tell you. Hey, look at verse number seven. Don't tell him I know this. But he told Jesus, but while I'm coming. 
Did you get that? He said, but while I'm coming. But while I'm coming. Is everybody all right? He told on himself. Jesus should have said, well, why do you keep going back to the porch? For 38 years, you get close. But then you keep going back. Just because you miss your turn don't mean you need to go back where you began. I've always wondered that myself. If he was coming, then why didn't he just stay next to the... All he had to do was jump in when the waters were troubled. You'll never be made whole going back to the porch. Some people, they love the porch. <laughs> they love being sick. Let me say something. I'm glad this morning that, I, listen, I'm not where I need to be with Jesus. I may not be where I ought to be with Jesus, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. Amen. I'm closer today than I was yesterday. And the old songwriter said, I've come too far to turn back now. He said, and while I was yet coming. Now this man's got a problem. He's believing in the wrong thing. He's telling Jesus what he believes in. He said, and when the water is troubled, and I can't get to the pool, and, and the, you know, the, the, the story was that the angel would descend down and trouble the water. They really didn't know what was happening. They didn't, know, they didn't understand the troubling of the water, and it's even disputed to this day what was actually happening in that pool. But I'm going to tell you something. Whether it was a true angel of the Lord doing it, or whether it was a folklore, we know that those waters had healing properties. But here you have the Son of God. Here you have Jesus coming down, the one that can change his life. And this man is putting his trust and his faith in superstition. He's putting his trust and his faith in some folklore. His trust and faith is in that pool and in those waters being troubled. And when Jesus asked him, wilt thou be made whole? He was digging deeper and deeper into that man's soul. And Jesus was more concerned with that man, what was going on on the inside, than he was really truly the outside. Jesus was more concerned in the who he believed in than the what that he believed in. A lot of people believe in the what. They don't know the who. Amen. Jesus is saying to him, when he's saying, wilt thou be made whole, you know what he's saying? I want you to get your eyes off them. Stop looking at them. Stop looking at all the excuses. Those that won't bring you to the pool. Those that are jumping over you. Those that, those that get in before you. Listen, get your eyes off man. Get your eyes off everybody else and get your eyes off your handicaps. Amen? Stop complaining about your wheelchair. Stop complaining about your crutches and, and, and for goodness sake, get your eyes off the pool. I'm not here to talk to you about the troubling of the water. I'm here to talk to you about me. Look at me. Fix your eyes on me. I'm the one that's going to help you. The pool can't help you. I can help you. That's a big deal. And this man, I don't know what happened. I, I, think, I think all of a sudden he did. At, at some point he said, you know what? He looks up at Jesus. And Jesus looks down at him. And he said, now I want you to do something. I want you to rise and take up thy bed. And I want you to walk. What's the Bible say happened? And immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And immediately, he took up his bed and walked. If you ever truly meet Jesus, he's not going to leave you the same way he found you. This man had a completely, totally different outtake on life because he that once was lame and crippled is now walking and living like the rest of us. 
total change. I'm talking about a 180 degree change. You show me somebody that has met Jesus and that's turned their life over to him, I'll show you somebody that's completely, totally different than they were the week prior or the month prior. The Bible says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. That's what the Bible says. There's a desire there. There's a change in this man's life. You say, is there a change? Let's read. Let's look what the Bible says. The Bible said in verse number 14 that Jesus is in the temple. And the Bible said that afterward Jesus findeth him in the temple. <laughs> the, the, when the man got a new set of legs, he didn't run to Las Vegas and say, man, I missed out on all the gambling. I missed out on all the liquor. I missed out on all the alcohol. I missed out on all the women. I'm telling you, when God gave him a new set of legs, the first place you found him was at the temple. He went to the house of God. He went where Jesus was. Jesus found him in the temple. If he ever changes your life, you're going to run to the house of God. You're going to run to the Bible and the Word of God. There will be a change in your life. He found him in the temple. <laughs> Praise God. Walking around in the temple. Could you imagine the people that saw him and said, is that him? Is, is that the guy? Wasn't he bought for 38 years? That man's been down there since I was a wee little kid. That man's been down there. But you know what he's doing in the temple? He's a walking. <laughs> he, hey man, he's a dancing. Uh, he's in the temple. Hey, God done something in his life. Right. That's why I like coming to church. It's where God changed my life. Right. Hey Amen. It's where God put my family together. Praise God. He walked to church. Praise the Lord. He said, I'm going to the temple. <laughs> I'm going to have myself a time. And the Bible said in verse number 15, that Je well, verse 14, Jesus come to him and he said, Behold, he said, Thou art made whole. Watch what he said. Sin no more lest a worse thing come unto thee. Sin no more. Watch, watch what the Bible says, verse number 15. The man departed, and he went to the Jews, the very ones that were going to arrest him for walking around on the Sabbath, the ones that told him what he had done was illegal. He goes to the authority. He goes to the Jews... And he tells them, he said, I got his name. <laughs> Y'all been wanting to know his name? Y'all want to know who it is? The Bible says he told them that it was Jesus that made him whole. I got saved. I think the Lord stopped by my way. He stopped by my Bethesda around 1130 at night on a Tuesday night. Take that back. It was on a Wednesday night around 11.30. He stopped by my Bethesda. And I'll never forget, I stood up on my own two feet and I felt like that 50-pound bag of bricks was gone. God had moved in, saved my soul. I was a walking and talking. The first thing I said, come out of my mouth, you can ask my parents. I said, I need to make a phone call. They said, it's 1130 at night. I said, I don't care. Time didn't, hey, I was so heavenly minded, I was no earthly good at that point. Time didn't matter. People having to go to work didn't matter. I got the church directory, and it was a big one. And I went through the directory and I called everybody at the church at 1130 at night. And you know what I was saying? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. How? Why are you dressed different? Eh? Why are you walking different? Why are you talking different? Why you got a song in your heart? It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. I'm a house of mercy. I'm a house of grace. There's a change in my life. It's Jesus. Right. Happened in 1996. Somebody run the math. How many years ago has that been? 26? 26? Everybody agree with 26 years? All in favor say, we vote on stuff at church. It's a Baptist church. We vote on stuff. All in favor say aye. 
It's been 26 years. And I got in my car of grace. And I drove down here on a tank of grace. Amen. With Biden inflation, it's grace. I pulled up to the house of God. Amen. And I came in here, got all suited up just to say one more time, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. That's the answer to all your problems. That's the answer to all your worries. That's the answer to all your handicaps. That's the answer to all your excuses. It's Jesus. He went and told them, it's Jesus. The Bible says in Psalm 40, man, does come to the piano. He says in Psalm 40, I was in a horrible pit. I was in the miry clay. What did the psalmist say? He said, and I cried, and the Lord heard my cry, and He lifted me out of that horrible pit. Now watch what happened. He set my foot on a solid rock. This is in Psalm 40. Go look it up. He put my foot on a solid rock. When you without Jesus, you ain't on a solid rock. You're unstable. But He'll put you on the rock and make you stable all of a sudden. He put me on the rock. He established my goings. Amen. He'll give you a new purpose. He'll give you a new direction. He'll give you a new zeal, new desire. He established my goings. Watch this. And he put a song in my mouth. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. They ain't no greater song than the song about Jesus. Right. Tell me the story. Tell me the story of Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Amen. Fills my ever longing. Keeps me singing as I go. Jesus. Now I'm going to tell you something. Last Sunday, it wasn't like this Sunday. Last Sunday, he decided to stop by Bethesda and trouble some waters. He troubled April's water. He troubled them waters. Somebody that was lame and crippled started walking. She got a song in her heart. I mean, showed up this morning for Sunday school. Is everybody all right? I get a little nervous when this crowd says they get saved and born again. Jesus comes in their heart. You can't find them with an FBI search warrant. <laughs> Well, it's Sunday. Well, I guess we're just going to sleep in. I got a headache. Not April. She said, come hell or high water. I'm going to the house of God because Jesus stopped my by Bethesda last Sunday. He rescued me. I didn't have to come here this morning. I wasn't made to come here. I got to come to church. Amen. Praise God. I was, I was excited. Privileged, honored. You know why? Because I'll never forget the day I was on the porch. And I was lost and undone without God. But Jesus passed by my way. And she sang it last week. And he made me whole that day. Just a sinner was I. But then Jesus passed by. Happiest day in your life is when you realize you're a sinner. That you're lost without hope. There's nothing you can do about it. And if you die in those conditions, you'll die and go to hell. But you heard about Jesus. And He speaks to your heart. And He draws you. And He woos you. And He stops by your Bethesda. And He troubles your waters. And then all of a sudden you say, you know what? I think I'm just going to throw myself at the foot of the cross. And I'm just going to fling myself at Jesus' feet. And I'm going to say, Jesus, you know what? I'm going to forsake my religion. I'm going to forsake my church membership. I'm going to forsake that water baptism I had. Lord, I need to get saved. And just get born again. Well, you, hey, when you do that and you throw yourself at Jesus' feet, <laughs> You might come to Sunday school too, praise God. Where'd they find this man as soon as he got healed? The same day. 
the temple. He's trying out them new legs walking up them stairs at the temple. Mercy and grace and love and long suffering. Now he's got joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nobody else that day at Bethesda got up and went to the temple. But that crippled man did. He don't have to speak to you. He don't have to pass by your way. But if he does pass by your way and he does speak to you and he knocks at your heart, and he asks you the question, will thou be made whole? You better answer. He may go somebody else. The songwriter said, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by.